some of the some of the things that I say directly relate, as you know, those of you who saw it last year too, but there are a few differences uh, relate to what Ben said because what we're doing with revenues, uh, of course, has to do with the budget. But the first thing I wanted to say is I've been reading some literature on trusteeship and those of you who've been in some of the meetings recently know that what we all know is that the partnership with the president and the trustees is critical. Uh, we need to be having no surprises for you, and we hope you don't give us any surprises either, although it's happened to me a time or two, and I'm sure it's happened to you as well. But you're essential links to our communities, the trustees are. So we need you to understand what we're talking about, and I would tell you that your presidents would tell you this, if something doesn't make sense or isn't understandable, we'd rather sit down with you and go over it and make sure it's clear. So don't be afraid to do that. And one of the things that I could say almost from the very beginning is that we are all different. So your model and my model or Ben's model may be very different and that's okay. And I'm gonna talk about that when I talk about our institution because I would tell you that our strategy has been much like Ben's to look at how we're gonna replace the state dollars. About four years ago, we started looking at what it would take and some of what it would take is something that uh, our trustees are not going to be willing to do. So it's a slower growth and probably you wouldn't either. But it meant that we would have to raise taxes 8% every year and that we would have to be very aggressive in tuition. And in fact, we have been very aggressive in tuition. And our tuition this fall is $115 a semester hour. And that doesn't feel very good when you think about Colin, when it's about 38, and some of you are about 40, you know, 45 or 50. But when you look at your tax base and you look at how many full-time faculty you have, it costs you more to have more full-time faculty. It's a lot cheaper to have a lot of adjunct faculty with fewer staff benefits or they're not on the faculty salary schedule. So one thing, and we have different tax bases, I'm gonna talk about that too, because if you're Dallas with 161 billion, you're, not gonna, you're gonna have more revenue than Ranger with about 61 million. Uh, or I think it's 92, I'll look at the number when we get there. But at any rate, we just need to know that what works for me or what works for Ben may be very different in your institution. And so I would encourage you to just look at what the differences are in the size of your tax base and that kind of thing. At our institution, we are $54.1 million at McLennan. And we have about 9,300 students, and that's down from last fall. And many of us are down. In the spring, there were 30-something of us down uh, that, that, that was very different. This fall, there could be as many as 75% of us who are down in enrollment. It's kind of bad when you go to the Chamber of Commerce, everybody wants to know, well, how much are you growing now? Because many of us have been growing a lot. So we have to explain that it's not necessarily a bad thing that uh, the enrollment is down a little bit. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But in my opinion, and I don't know how many of you agree with me, I really think the financial change has been the greatest thing. There's some economy things, but in Waco, our poverty is about 28 or 29 percent. So I think we've had a lot of people on financial aid, and some of them really weren't really coming to us for the right reasons. Many of them, it's made a difference in their lives, but there are many others who this was a welfare program for them. So with the newer satisfactory progress and excessive hours, some of them are falling off the system, and some of them should. Uh, we want to be educating those who are there to learn, and many of them, the Pell Grants and that kind of thing does make a big difference. But at our institution, we have 824 um, employees, and of our faculty, about 65 to 70% of all of our classes are taught by full-time uh, faculty. But that doesn't mean that's how many we have. We have a fairly generous overload policy, and that can make a difference to when in your community, if you don't have the availability of full-time faculty, you may have to hire more, which costs you more. And some of you may have a very limit on what you allow uh, faculty to teach overloads. And that's pretty popular with a lot of people, and Sachs has kind of looked at that, the, our accrediting agency. But we've kind of, uh, open that up some for us. So we have some of our faculty who may be teaching two overloads in one semester or even three at times. 
And so they are paid at the part-time rate. And that's another thing as far as uh, revenue and cost is how you compensate. In the old days, we used to, when I was at Paris, and then we changed it, they used to uh, get a time, and you would get part of your full-time rate if you taught an overload. And I remember a faculty member coming to us and saying, we'll teach for the part-time rate because we're not having the opportunities to teach overloads. And we'd rather do that at the part-time rate than not having the opportunity. So we have a lot of different things like that. Um, one of the things I'll mention, do we have anybody here from TSTC? Okay, not today. I'll just say a couple of things. Probably most of you know that as community colleges, we're political subdivisions, but that TSTC is a state agency. So they're funded a little bit differently. I was looking at those numbers on the, the money, the valuation, and Dallas is 161.9 and Ranger is 92.6. Some of this will seem a little bit repetitive because you know you have tuition and fees and you have local taxes and state appropriations. And at the bottom are some numbers of what the current percentages are statewide or they were the past year. As far as 38% or tuition and fees is what had been funded the budget, 32% local taxes and 30% state appropriations. You know as trustees you have the authority to raise tuition but you just have to decide what, what is your institution want to do. For us, we are the second highest tuition in the state. I don't say that with pride, but to fund the programs we want to do and the way we want to do it, and that's been our source of not being so dependent on state resources. And I'll show a slide about that in a minute. And the Pell Grant is really important to us. You as trustees, can talk to your legislators about that being our very most important thing because that is what makes a difference for many of our students to be able to come to school. And the local taxes, some communities, colleges, uh, most everybody's under the cap. There's one I noticed that's right at the cap of, the, of 25 cents. And as Ben told you, at their institution, their board and their voters have set the cap at less than 25 cents. But as far as uh, taxes, we have maintenance and operation taxes. And if you have debt service, you also have debt service taxes. You can go up every year as much as 8% on your local taxes with just having public hearings. And you're not subject to a rollback. And so at your institution, some of you may feel very comfortable doing that. We went up 5.5%, um, I guess, this year. We had recommended our 5%. We had recommended 75 and at the budget board uh, final vote, the board decided to lower it because they thought that would be more appealing to our taxpayers. So you've got that option. We had had the public hearings. And then on the state appropriations, um, we're beginning to see a difference in that. And there's some things on the uh, documents on the TACC website that you might want to look at, and I've incorporated a few of those into here. And this just kind of shows what some of the differences have been and how they've grown from 2000 for in-district and out-of-district. And we see what our enrollment has done. In this fall, we anticipate it is going to go down a little bit. All of the numbers are not in yet, so we don't have that. But the anticipation is that probably 75% of us will be down, and some will be up. Another factor, and we don't really know how much is affected, is the new meningitis requirement. I know you've noticed a lot more activity, and it's been easier when students just can sign a waiver if they don't want to do it and feel like they can object to it in that way. So I know we've had a lot more students who've chosen that. But it was pretty uh, tough in the spring when we were trying to make sure everyone had the right shot or the certification. And here is the maintenance and operation rate kind of statewide, if you see kind of what it is for everyone, uh, down to 14.4% is an average. The total tax that you can have if you go by the state statute is a dollar, and that would be 25% on m and and for our institution it's 75%, uh, it could be on debt service, but hardly anyone has very high debt service. 27 institutions do have a debt service, 
and those were the tax bonds that Ben mentioned, where our voters vote to allow us to have money for primarily capital projects. Some of you have a philosophy not to borrow any money, so you may have no debt service. But we have debt service, and we have debt service for about $75 million is the last one when we built several new buildings. And that's been really important for our growth because we had to have a place for the students to be. If you have a question, I think probably be better to do it when we've kind of gone through the slides. And here is the valuation. And valuation is the total value of the property in the district. Seven districts really account for 70% of the total valuation. And they would be the people you would think, Alamo, Austin, Collin, Dallas, Houston, Lone Star, and Tarrant. The total revenue, the levy, of course, are the total taxes collected. And that's a big issue for some, and I know uh, Texarkana is now looking at a tax uh, annexation, and so we really hope y'all have great success with that. For us, our tax district is coterminous with most of our service area in McLennan County. Some of you have multiple counties. Some of you, it's not even the whole city. I remember when I was in Paris that it expanded to where it was the whole city. So uh, it's a big deal as to who's going to pay taxes to you. But the expanding isn't the easiest thing to do. We'll all be watching what happens in Texarkana and hope because uh, it, we know several people who've lost elections trying to do that and y'all work real hard. And then we talked a little bit about the state appropriations going down. And uh, so in 12-13, it was a 21.8% decrease. We, don't, we can't really make our budget plans planning on having more state appropriations, but being proactive about replacing that means more budget cuts, our tuition and fees, our taxes. This is just another slide that kind of shows Back in 1980, 68% came from the state, and then it's down to around 30 overall. But again, you have, we have to remember that it's very different for different ones of us. This is McLennan Community College. With our focus on replacing state appropriations with tuition, we're up to 50% coming from the students. When I showed this slide to the faculty, they just about gasped because you can see it was 10.4% in 1979, and it's up to 50%. The state appropriations uh, were at 74.9, and you see they're back down to about 25. And the taxes are not too different. I think all of us are rather hesitant. They've gone from 10.4 to 21, but in comparison to what's happened with the tuition, it's different. And I think you'll get a copy of this, uh, and this is the same one from last year, to just kind of look through what the budget cycle is for the state, where we submit, agencies submit budgets, and the LBB and governor's office submit requests to the legislature, and the bills are created. Then we have a conference committee, and then the governor has final approval, and there are dates to go along with that. The money that the Texas legislature appropriates are called general revenue funds. And that's supposed to cover instructional and administrative costs, but your auxiliary can't come out of that money, your grant funds cannot come out of that money, nor physical plant. And Ben talked a little bit too about uh, the primary sources from the state. The general revenue fund is something to remember because that's where the legislature has the authority to, to use the money for us and for many other things too. And um, Ben also talked about with Medicaid and those kind of things that it's kind of hard to compete with those requests. But if we don't invest in our economy, then it's going to be a problem at some point. Now, I want to go back, and those of you who've seen this before, this really hit me. This was from Don Hudson's dissertation. 
And when you look at where we are now, and we're all moaning about the percent we get from the state, if you look prior to 41, 1941, we didn't get anything. And then in the 47th legislature, they based it on the number of full-time student equivalents. And that was in the fall semester. So in other words, you looked at what you had in the fall, and that's what the money was based on for the whole year. So some colleges didn't even offer summer classes. So if you think about in 41, the total amount from the state was $650,000. And there were 32 community colleges in 67. And what really has upped everything is the large urban areas added colleges. And that's, they're training, as you know, a lot of the students in there, a lot of the transfer students. So with the 15 new college districts, that's when the cost really went up as far as what the state was paying. Then we changed to the formula system in 73. And that's where it's based on contact hours. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But in 65, state appropriations were 27% of the total revenues. So thinking about before the formula, that's not too different from what it is today. The formula really changed many things. The first thing that happens on the formula rate is that we all do what we call a cost study. It has another name, the report of fundable operating expenses. We all say, what is it costing at our institutions? And it all goes together. And then, of course, you might know an English uh, course would cost less than teaching nursing or technology that has a lot of equipment. So the costs are, are very different from one program to another. This is kind of a flow of funds. You see where community, the students pay tuition and fees. You have scholarships and waivers. And as you're looking at your total budget and what your allocation is, how much you allocate to scholarships can be pretty significant. Also, on your dual enrollment, whether you're charging tuition and fees or not. That's a big number for some of us. We waive fees for financial need. And I still think I waive about 400000 a year. Some of you waive everything. Some of you collect all of your tuition and fees. And that's a big thing as far as your budget is concerned. The federal government dollars have become more and more important. And when you start having enrollment losses, I really believe some of that is when students are not coming to school. And the amount of Pell is going to make a difference. So the formula. This, this talks about the reallocation model, and we really don't know next year whether it's going to happen or not. But the formula appropriation is set by the legislator, legislature, and the funds are allocated, as I just mentioned, on contact hours for the formula rate. And it's the contact hours by the rate by the percent funding. I have another slide that shows that a little bit better. I think we all thought the reallocation model might not happen again, but we don't know. And you know we went through a pretty tough time in deciding whether we were going to all participate or not in, in the whole harmless. And since we didn't, then we went back to the original reallocation. This is just an example of what the formula rates look like. You might know that the formula rates for TSTC right now are about 25% higher. And part of that is because the tuition is built into the formula. And they're getting ready to do a value al uh, added formula where their funding is going to be based on their graduates and placement rather than on the contact hour formula. So theirs is about to change. And this is just a slide that kind of shows what contact hours are like. Each semester we think of that as 16 week long. And so for each student that sits in a three-hour sociology class, that would be 16 weeks times three hours a week, or 48 contact hours. So we add up all of the students in the class. So if there were 10 students in the class, it'd be 10 times 48. So that would be 480 times whatever the formula rate is. Now we know the formula rate's going down, 
So we know it's uh, not something we can expect even if we're growing to have more money. In fact, some of the colleges who grew, if you grow less than other people, you can still get less money from state aid appropriations. And that has happened. But this is just an example of what contact hours are. And this shows our kind of uh, what might happen on contact hours going down. You see we've been going up. But then in 12, 13 and in 14, 15, they very well could um, be less. Our main categories are state appropriations, group health insurance, and retirement. And this is from the last time. Just to give you an idea of what happened in the change, we were down 6% in the state appropriations from the base year, 38% in group health insurance, and 48% retirement. That's why you hear that as being a very important uh, for us to, for a category. Although we've not always had uh, the retirement or group health insurance the way we have. It's what we've gotten accustomed to do to make our budgets. If you haven't seen this yet, you might want to look at the TACC website. This is kind of what we're talking about for the upcoming legislative session. That we're, we're talking about looking at core operations for a million dollars for each district and then using student success points. We've all changed our dialogue from what it used to be. So that we used to be talking about just enrollment and now we are talking about success in everything we're doing and then the contact hours. But there's, this is on the TACC website too. And I thought I'd mention a little bit about student success initiatives. Uh, we're not one of the 31 colleges who are achieving the dream institutions. Uh, many people have gotten into the program for different ways. Some have gotten grants for either individually or I think the Gulf Coast came in all at one time, didn't you? No? Second, so. But all of you are part of achieving the dream, aren't you? So, you know, it's a really good program and so I've been impressed with what you're doing. Those of us who haven't been in it have been have participated in other things like the Governance Institute for Students for Success and also uh, Success by the Numbers. And then we've had our own programs. And many of us with our quality enhancement plans in the accreditation have come up with new programs. And that's what we've done with our LEAP program, the Learning Environment Adaptability Project. And we've added success coaches and early alert systems. And some of these are the same kind of things that the Achieving the Dream Colleges have done. We're talking about the same thing, we just haven't uh, been involved in the program. Many of you have seen the student success points model and that's kind of uh, what we're proposing. It's based on the momentum points, which we remember that from the last uh, session when we started talking about it. Then I thought I'd talk a minute about the history of the employee group health insurance because prior to 78, we didn't have any of the benefits that we have today from the state. Then in 78 to 91, we received health insurance for each eligible employee. And that's been kind of what the fight has been that we, we were accustomed to receiving the state benefits for the eligible employee. And that's kind of been reduced kind of somewhat of a proportionality model, I guess I would say. In 91, we also were brought into the employee retirement system. So you ask why are we on state insurance? We used to all bid all of our insurance, and this was a requirement that we participate, and it's, it's been a pretty good program, I think. But the main issue continues to be the eligibility versus the revenue source. And we've been talking about that for a large number of years now and also the state's obligation to pay retirement. And most of you know that's not totally settled this year, even today. We're looking at how we're gonna report those this year on our audits. Employee only is paid by the state. 
and then part of the family costs are paid. I don't know if you've taken a look at your institution at how many pay additionally for employee and spouse or employee and family, but you find out that many of your lower paid uh, employees don't pay any more. They gladly accept employee only, but they're not nearly as many who pay extra. So there are a lot of uncovered uh, individuals at our institutions as far as their family is concerned. They don't have to pay anything. You probably know that. They can participate in employee only. So all of our employees can have insurance. It's just that we are paying for a good percent of that now. In the early days when we could report eligible employees, then the state paid for all of those except for auxiliary and fiscal plant grants. And never, those have never been included. But today, all of these employees must participate and then we end up paying that amount ourselves to subsidize it. And then we're talking about, of course, the retirement today as well. And the changes in budgeting. We had the annual reallocation this year. It's kind of scary. Uh, some people lost a lot of money. Some of us lost a little bit. And it was really, uh, I think for us, it was another $216,000 because of the reallocation. That would be something we hope goes away, but we don't know if it will or not yet. There's still retirement changes that are unknown and the state appropriation reductions. We have started budgeting differently than I've ever budgeted before in the past couple of years, and that is we've started budgeting for what we think might be reduced from the state. We used to just hope it all worked out and then we would you know, cut during the year. But we have set aside uh, several million dollars just in case that that happens. And if it doesn't happen, then that'll go into fund balance or be used for other things like technology. That's one of the things we've done at the end of the year. If we go through the year and we think we're gonna have some money in the fund balance, that's when we buy our technology at the end of the year. And then it's, it's an item that gets cut at the first of the year because it's one of those big numbers on requested technology. So that generally happens every year at our institution. So the conclusions is that the basic sources, of course, are tuition, taxes and state appropriations, trustees determine what the tuition is. Also, you can go up to 8% every year on maintenance and operation taxes. And the state appropriations continue to change. The impact of the decisions at the federal level are pretty huge on the state, on the financial aid this year. Also, the requirement that students provide an IRS transcript rather than just a copy of their tax return, that slowed down some students' ability to come in. The recalculating the uh, satisfactory progress every semester instead of once a year, that's gonna make some differences. So there are many changes in the federal level that affect us and the amount students get on Pell, what happens to them on loans, and uh, how easy it is for some to get loans and some that are paid back, some that are not. We also talked about the state appropriations have changed. The thing to remember is your institution may be very different from mine or Ben's. Ours it's now 50% is tuition from our students, they're paying, and that's pretty sobering when you're giving scholarships and other decisions you make, and the students who are paying the full ride are subsidizing the others in some extent. On the dual enrollment, all those on financial need, somebody's having to pay for that. And the local taxes do account for about 60% of intuition of lo total local revenue. But we all have to be innovative, and we need to decide for our institution what's the best thing for us? How many part-time faculty are you gonna have? How many overloads are you gonna allow your faculty to teach? And in everything we're doing, we're finding the need to reallocate our money so that we can invest in more success initiatives. Many of us can remember when we didn't think technology, you know, why are we having to spend a little bit of money on that? And that's become part of our budgets. And also the success initiatives uh, those are things that have price tags, and we're all very hopeful that the results on retention will be very helpful. Now, does anybody have any questions?
I think it'll, of course, it, again, things are different, and this is just my opinion. I think once we get our retention strategies in much better place that we'll come back and enrollment will grow again. But I think for now, as the financial aid rules are getting tighter and the economy has been what it is, uh, and in some areas, I know, I think maybe Midland, Odessa, and maybe in South Texas, where the, uh, where it's very good employment, I think that hurts those institutions too. But I, I really think we're going to come back, but I think we're going to still see some decline. I don't know, you might ask some of the other presidents what they think. I don't think any of it does now, but I would have to ask our state. I think it's going to public schools. Does anybody have any information on that? It would just be a guess on my part. I remember when they first started the lottery, they asked us to put a information in the paycheck saying, you know, the lottery's going to help you, and that didn't last very long, one semester. We haven't done that. Some of the institutions are doing that for the higher cost. We, uh, ours is just $115 for tuition and fees, but we haven't done that, but some are. Paula? Well, it is. I don't know. It's uh, that's it's it's huge for our institution, and I'm sure it's for many of yours. And then we really don't know what's going to happen, you know, on the retirement at this point that we set aside to pay back that we haven't paid back yet. That's an interesting question too. Any other questions? Well, I just, uh, I think you'll have a copy of this presentation. If you want to ask me about it later, I'm happy to answer.